Hollywood, a land where fame and fortune collide with the hidden vices of the elite. Behind the silver screen, away from the flashing cameras, lie parties so depraved they're whispered about but never openly discussed. These aren't mere parties. They are the playgrounds of the rich and famous, where rules bend and morals blur. From scandalous rendezvous to unrestrained indulgences, these meetings shape careers and shatter lives. In a world where every action is a performance, what happens when the cameras stop rolling? This is the untold story of Hollywood's most depraved parties. The Garden of Allah parties. In the throes Hollywood's nightlife, numerous establishments catered to the indulgences of actors, but none achieved the notoriety of the Garden of Allah. Initially, this opulent haven, situated on Sunset Boulevard and known as Havenhurst, belonged to William H. Hay. It underwent a transformation when purchased by Russian actress Alla Nazimova. Despite being married, Nazimova engaged in numerous affairs with women and the venue soon gained a reputation as a rare haven in Hollywood where lesbian and bisexual women could openly express their sexuality. Legend has it that Nazimova coined the term sewing circle to describe this group of discreetly queer actresses. In 1926, Nazimova expanded the property by constructing 25 villas and converting it into a hotel. Already renowned for its extravagant parties, the garden became the private sanctuary where Hollywood stars could freely indulge their vices away from the public eye and prying reporters. The list of devotees included iconic names like Marlene Dietrich, Humphrey Bogart, Errol Flynn, Orson Welles, Laurence Olivier, John Barrymore, and Greta Garbo. Publicist Bernie Woods once recounted an anecdote involving bandleader Tommy Dorsey, who, aiming to assert his popularity, encountered fellow bandleader Kay Kaiser at the hotel. In a bold display, Dorsey paraded two naked women from his bedroom, each with their pubic hair groomed, to spell out the letters T and D. The Macambo Club Parties Situated on the Sunset Strip, the Macambo Club emerged as a magnetic hub for Hollywood's creme de la creme during the 1940s and 1950s. Renowned for its sophisticated ambiance and alluring charm, the club played host to an array of scandalous events that became synonymous with the excesses of old Hollywood. One of the primary attractions at the Mocambo was the allure of excessive drinking and revelry. The club's exclusive clientele, comprised of A-list celebrities, socialites, and industry power players, reveled in an atmosphere of uninhibited merriment. Tables adorned with champagne bottles became commonplace, and the clinking of glasses accompanied the laughter and animated conversations that filled the air. Illicit activities further fueled the club's notoriety. The Mocambo was rumored to be a hotspot for discreet liaisons and clandestine affairs among Hollywood's glitterati. Secret trysts, hidden behind the club's dimly lit corners, added an air of mystery to the already glamorous setting. The discreet charm of the Mocambo allowed celebrities to escape the prying eyes of the public and indulge in behaviors that would have been scandalous if exposed. Substances of various kinds were said to be part of the scene at the Mocambo. While the specifics remain shrouded in legend, tales of celebrities partaking in the recreational use of substances added an edge to the club's reputation. Whether it was the allure of escaping reality or simply enhancing the night's festivities, the Mocambo became a space where Hollywood's elite could let loose and indulge in a world far removed from the public gaze. Cal Neva Lodge Parties Frank Sinatra's ownership of the Calneva Lodge in Lake Tahoe marked an era of legendary extravagance and debauchery that added an intriguing chapter to the lore of old Hollywood. The lodge, nestled within the scenic beauty of Lake Tahoe, became synonymous with wild parties, whispers of connections to the notorious Rat Pack, and rumors of entanglements with organized crime. The Calneva Lodge, under Sinatra's ownership, transformed into a haven where Hollywood's elite could revel away from the prying eyes of the public. The rumors of wild parties that emanated from the lodge painted a picture of excess and indulgence that matched the larger-than-life persona of Sinatra himself. 
Champagne flowed freely, and the nights were filled with the sounds of laughter, music, and the clinking of glasses against the backdrop of the picturesque lake. The Rat Pack, led by Sinatra, was said to have been a frequent presence at the Calneva Lodge. The Rat Pack, a close-knit group of entertainers that included luminaries like Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and others, was notorious for its camaraderie and affinity for revelry. The Lodge provided an intimate setting for the Rat Pack's escapades, where they could unwind, perform, and engage in the kind of uninhibited merrymaking that defined their public personas. And the Hayes Code Parties During the era of the Hayes Code, a set of Gidilanis established to regulate the moral content of films, some Hollywood figures orchestrated parties that stowed as defiant spectaclists, challenging the constraints imposed by the industry's moral watchdogs. These gatherings became notorious for their explicit entertainment and behavior, providing an illicit counterpoint to the sanitized narratives prevalent in mainstream cinema. At these Hayes Code-defying parties, the air was charged with an atmosphere of rebellion, as Hollywood insiders sought to push the boundaries of acceptable behavior. Explicit entertainment was a central feature with performances and displays that brazenly flouted the proudish norms dictated by the Hayes Code. Burlesque dancers, often pushing the limits of risque, took center stage, captivating the audience with their provocative routines that would have been deemed scandalous in the more controlled environment of the silver screen. The boundaries of interpersonal relationships were also tested at these gatherings. The parties reportedly embraced a laissez-faire attitude towards romantic and intimate engagements, challenging the conventional moral standards of the time. Extramarital affairs and liaisons unfolded amidst the glitz and glamour of Hollywood's social elite, adding a layer of scandal to the festivities. Substances, including alcohol and possibly more illicit substances, were said to flow freely at these events, contributing to an atmosphere of uninhibited revelry. The liberating effects of these substances likely played a role in fostering an environment where inhibitions were cast aside, and attendees felt free to engage in behavior that would have been deemed taboo in the controlled world of studio-approved films. The Hayes Code defying parties served as an underground rebellion against the moral constraints imposed on the film industry. Attendees, including actors, producers, and other industry insiders, reveled in the opportunity to express themselves in ways forbidden on screen. The events became both a celebration of personal freedom and an act of defiance against the moral guardians of the time. May West's wild parties and May's parties were more than gatherings, they were extravagant spectacles that defied the constraints of the era's moral codes. The forbidden nectar of the prohibition, alcohol flowed freely, clandestinely served in crystal glasses, a nod to the defiance of the law that attempted to keep libations at bay. The clinking of glasses and the murmur of laughter formed a symphony that reverberated against the walls of May's opulent abode. The guest list was a who's who of Hollywood's elite, actors, producers, and power players, all seeking refuge in the sanctuary of May's parties, shielded from the prying eyes of the authorities. The flickering candlelight danced upon the faces of notable figures like Clark Gable, Greta Garbo, and Cary Grant, each with a glint in their eye, reveling in the liberation that May West's domain offered. May, draped in luxurious gowns that accentuated her legendary curves, played the role of both hostess and provocateur. Her quick wit and innuendo-laden banter set the tone for the evenings, breaking through the veneer of Hollywood propriety. As the night progressed, the atmosphere shifted from glamour to a heady mix of scandal and liberation. Rumors swirled about the more risque activities that unfolded within the walls of May's mansion. Some claimed that hidden corners were the backdrop for discreet liaisons and trysts, shattering the boundaries of societal expectations. The illicit whispers spoke of secret rooms where poker games played out, and the laughter of those engaging in forbidden pleasures became a harmonious melody. While the tales of Mae West's raucous parties are steeped in myth and exaggeration, there is a grain of truth to the notion that she offered a haven for those who sought to flout societal norms. 
One thing is true, the stars of the Golden Age knew how to have a good time. They were known for hosting some of the most famous parties of the era with some of the top people in society in attendance. You could be sure to see all kinds of things at such parties, from overflowing booze to vices. While all of these are normal at parties, some of these Golden Age parties went too far and even made it into the news because of how scandalous they were. From the rumored orgies at Jane Mansfield's mansion to Fatty Arbuckle's deadly party, these 10 scandalous parties that took place in the Golden Age still shock people to this day. The Roaring Twenties Party In the mid-1950s, America's power couple, Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds, decided to host a party in their backyard, but this was not just any party. It was one that got people talking for a while. A good number of Hollywood couples threw parties in their homes during the Golden Age, but Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds' 1955 party was said to be unforgettable. At the time, Eddie Fisher was known for his smooth and romantic chart-topping hits, while Debbie Reynolds, who was clearly smitten by the singer, was making waves as an actress. They both were at the peak of their careers in the 50s, and they were determined to keep working towards their goals. But every now and then, the couple loved to unwind and have fun by partying. Achieving such great things and getting famous in their 20s left them feeling fulfilled, and what better way to celebrate than to organize a party-themed Roaring Twenties. They wanted to enjoy their youth along with friends, and that was exactly what they did. They decided to transform their garage into a playroom as they set out to host one of the most exclusive parties in town. They invited some young stars like Tab Hunter, the poster boy for Teenage Dreams, and Leon Tyre, the charming actor. When the party began, everything seemed innocent, and the atmosphere was electric with the promise of a night to remember. But soon enough, it became obvious that this was not a regular party. It was a party where seemingly innocent young stars came ready to unleash their wild side. The party gave them permission to shed their public personas and reveal a wild side hidden from the prying eyes of the paparazzi. It was said that the party was not one for innocent eyes as subtle glances turned into lingering touches and the stars allegedly consumed all kinds of substances. From the pictures that circulated after the party, one could see that they all let loose and partied with reckless abandon. Most of the stars there were busy exploring their raw, untamed passion, and no one was left out of the fun. Only the people who attended the party truly know what happened that night, but rumors circulated that it was a bit too wild. No one expected it to turn out that way, especially because Debbie Reynolds and Eddie were known to have a wholesome image. MGM's Dark 1937 Party The MGM's Grand Party in 1937 was an event that a lot of people enjoyed, but for one actress, Patricia Douglas, it turned into a night she desperately wanted to erase. According to reports, the party was organized in Los Angeles in honor of MGM's top salesman. There were already rumors about the strange things that the top men in the studio did behind closed doors, but not many people knew the extent of it. Before the party began, the studio brought the salesman in by train from different parts of the country, and it looked like it was going to be the most glamorous party of the year. The event was extravagant, with star-studded meet-and-greets, marching bands to lead the way, and even a fleet of motorcycle cops providing a grand entrance. There was a private rail car, brimming with promise, booze, and lively conversations. To commence the ceremony which was to take place at the famous Ambassador Hotel, MGM's Louis B. Mayer stepped on stage and gave a speech. But it was after the ceremony that the convention's grandeur took a dark twist. The centerpiece was a lavish party with the comedic brilliance of Laurel and Hardy and the mesmerizing Dandridge sisters. And there was an open bar ensuring that spirits were as high as the Hollywood Hills. Yet, amid all the dazzle, Patricia Douglas, a dancer and movie extra, found herself in a nightmarish situation. She was one of 120 young women told they were destined for an on-location film shoot that evening. However, once they arrived, they realized they were trapped in an event with a sinister underbelly. It was said that the party was not a normal party, but a stag party. Several strange acts were rumored to have taken place on that night, but one of the most shocking was what happened to the young actress Patricia Douglas. As the night wore on, Douglas, amid the glitz and glamour, 
was allegedly targeted by a drunken salesman who not only forced her to consume alcohol, but also took alleged advantage of her. Never in her lifetime would she have thought that someone would do such a thing to her. She was devastated and shocked, but Patricia was not one to stay silent. She raised her voice and spoke out about what happened to her. She explained every detail, hoping to get justice. Unfortunately, the court was not exactly in her favor, not because she was lying, but because MGM allegedly made the story disappear. MGM didn't want the world to know that one of their best salesmen took advantage of an underage girl at a party they organized. This kind of scandal would have tarnished the image of the studio forever, so they used their influence to make the scandal disappear. Jane Mansfield's Wild Mansion Party Mansfield was a Hollywood star who defined the word wild. She was known for her fearless embrace of sensuality and glamour. Her figure-hugging outfits, her trademark blonde bombshell hair, and her smile were the weapons in her arsenal. She made sure the cameras loved her, and they sure did. But the wildness didn't stop at her looks. Jane was a party animal, and her Hollywood Hills mansion was the backdrop for some of the wildest soirees that ever graced the hills. If you want to have an idea of what her parties looked like, picture a mansion in the Hollywood Hills with the stars twinkling overhead and the poolside lit up like a movie set. This was the setting for one of Jane Mansfield's notorious house parties, a place where the word excess took on a whole new meaning. Excessive drinking, late night revelry, and perhaps more were part of the package. There are rumors that these soirees weren't just about clinking glasses and polite chit chat. The night would often take on a more uninhibited vibe, with guests participating in some, let's say, risque activities. There were rumors that her guests got involved in orgies during these parties. Some people even said she taped these acts for her guests. Yet it wasn't just about the parties. Jane Mansfield was also known for her infamous affairs with some of the biggest names of the time, including Robert Kennedy and his brother, John F. Kennedy and it's safe to say that both Kennedys seem to have a thing for the blonde bombshell. What happened behind the closed doors of Jane Mansfield's house remains veiled in the allure of an era when stars lived larger than life. The Las Vegas Wild Party Although the stars of old Hollywood partied a lot, these parties were mostly private and exclusive. Most times, only the stars in attendance witnessed firsthand what really happened in these parties. However, some of these parties made it to the tabloids because of the rumors that circulated about them. One of these parties was a 1950 Las Vegas party that played host to Montgomery Clift and an array of luminaries. On this particular night, a lavish party was about to unfold within the hallowed walls of a nightclub. The club was said to have imported several Hollywood stars for the party which started off as a banquet. As the clock struck midnight, a parade of Hollywood's most illustrious names descended upon the club. Among the stars, the charismatic Daisy Arnaz, the enchanting Lucille Ball, and the alluring Marlene Dietrich took center stage. The party started with a fancy dinner, but as the hours ticked by, things got wild. Photographs captured by the flashbulbs of the era's paparazzi showed a glimpse of the spectacle unfolding behind the club's closed doors. Rows of champagne glasses glistened in the dimly lit room, and laughter and chatter filled the air. But it was what remained hidden from those photos that ignited the most scandalous rumors. While it looked like the party was a casual get-together, these Hollywood stars wanted to do more than just meeting and sipping champagne. They wanted to let loose and do things that they would never be caught doing in public. Behind the scenes, there was a lot going on. Rumors started to spread about this party. People said there was lots of drinking and even some drug use. Even the stars that were known to be reserved and laid back unleashed another side. The club made room for these Hollywood stars to do whatever they wanted. There were no restrictions, but they did all these with the understanding that whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. From every indication, the party turned into something wilder than anyone expected. The stars, known for their perfect public images, took off their masks, let loose, and did things that were a bit scandalous. Errol Flynn's Weird Parties Because of how wild and wayward Errol Flynn was as a child, his own mother had a hard time coping with him. As a result of this, their relationship was rocky, 
and she even referred to him as the devil for some weird reason. Interestingly, Errol grew up to become an adventurous man who did not live by the rules, and he became a party animal too. While his career was thriving, the actor was hosting all kinds of parties in his mansion, and most of these parties were scandalous. Almost every week, he came together with the likes of Clark Gable, David Niven, and Olivia de Havilland to party. It was alleged that some of these stars even enjoyed watching the wild animals at the back of Flynn's house. It was said that his mansion was a sprawling Spanish-style abode with hidden alcoves and secret passageways. It's the perfect setting for a night of revelry. Now it's said that the drinks flowed freely at Flynn's parties, and it wasn't just your run-of-the-mill cocktails. We're talking about top-shelf liquor and champagne that never seemed to run out. The laughter and the clinking of glasses were only rivaled by the sound of jazz music filling the air. As the night went on, the parties took on a life of their own. Flynn, known for his charm and charisma, was at the center of it all, regaling guests with stories of his adventures. But it wasn't just about conversation. His parties were rumored to have been wild with guests dancing with abandon and whispers of romantic escapades in hidden corners of the mansion. But it was said that most of the guests who attended his parties preferred not to talk about what happened behind closed doors. It was almost like he turned his house into a place where his co-stars came and did wild things, things they wouldn't dare to do on camera. Hedda Hopper's unforgettable birthday bash. You've probably heard of some wild Hollywood parties, but this one was next level. Hedda Hopper was a prominent American gossip columnist and actress known for her influential role in the world of Hollywood journalism. The star-studded guest list read the likes of Judy Garland and Clark Gable, two icons in their own right, walking through the door. You can imagine the paparazzi bulbs popping like crazy, capturing every moment of what was shaping up to be a legendary night. The setting was as lavish as they come. We're talking about decorations that could rival the grandeur of a blockbuster film set. The champagne was excess, and there was an air of decadence hanging heavy in the room. However, the party wasn't just about mingling and sipping bubbly. It was rumored that the drinks were more than just cocktails. They were a one-way ticket to the wildest stories you'd ever hear. The excessive drinking was almost a given, and the night seemed to unravel into one for the Hollywood history books. The details of what exactly went down have been hushed over the years, reminding us that sometimes what happens in Hollywood stays tantalizingly behind closed doors. Joan Crawford's 1951 Party Let's step back in time to 1951 when the glamour of Hollywood was in full swing. A party to remember was in the works and the star of the show, none other than Joan Crawford herself. The party took place at Stork Club, New York, but it was not your regular party. The Stork Club in Hollywood is a name that resonates with late night revelry and the kind of extravagance that only old Hollywood could conjure. This was the place where Frank Sinatra crooned, Marilyn Monroe dazzled, and Humphrey Bogart owned the night. But that fateful night, Joan Crawford was the star of the night. Joan Crawford was known for being one of the most prominent and versatile actresses in the golden age of Hollywood. She was celebrated for her remarkable career, spanning several decades, and was renowned for her roles in films like Mildred Pierce, Possessed, and The Woman. The actress was also said to be a free spirit. When it came to partying, she did whatever she pleased. So on that starry night, Joan Crawford arrived at the Stork Club in grand style, ready to let loose and paint the town red. Rumor had it that the party took a wild turn. The party may have looked like an innocent gathering on the surface, but it was nothing close to innocent behind closed doors. After the party, photographs from the party began to circulate like wildfire and showcased Joan, the epitome of Hollywood elegance, letting her hair down, indulging in vices, and having the time of her life. It was a party where some glamorous stars had their moments of wild abandon. Sophia Loren's Los Angeles Party 
It was the year 1957, and Sophia Loren was throwing a party that was about to go down in Hollywood's history. If you've ever seen that iconic snapshot of Sophia eyeing Jane Mansfield's daring cleavage, well, that's just a sneak peek of what was in store that fateful night. The Paramount Pictures lot was buzzing with anticipation, all for the lady of the hour. Sophia Loren. You see, this wasn't your average soiree. This was an ode to glamour, star power, and a touch of wildness. Hollywood bombshells and the creme de la creme of Tinseltown's leading men were in attendance. The guest list read like a Hollywood walk of fame. But it wasn't just the people in attendance that caught people's attention. It was the things that they indulged in. If there was a queen of wild parties, it would be her. And guess what? She was there right by Sophia's side. You just knew this night was about to take a walk on the wild side. The pictures from the party showed that Jane Mansfield had let go completely and was ready to have a good time. Behind those closed doors, things were heating up. People indulged in vices, puffing on cigarettes and sipping cocktails like there was no tomorrow. The air was thick with laughter, secrets, and that unmistakable Hollywood magic. People whispered about clandestine affairs, hidden rendezvous, and wild antics that made this party legendary. The truth is, it played out just like any other wild Hollywood soiree, excess, indulgence, and stories to tell for years to come. Sophia Loren's 1957 party was a night to remember, or maybe one to forget, depending on how much you indulged. The Wild Garden of Allah Party the Garden of Allah was a grand stage for Hollywood's wildest rendezvous in the 1920s and 30s. This wasn't just a hotel, it was a swirling maelstrom of glamour, gin, and gossip. The things that happened in this hotel would shock anyone who wasn't part of Hollywood's elite. Imagine stepping through the hotel's grand entrance, the faint strains of jazz dancing in the air. The lobby, adorned with Art Deco splendor, was calm before the storm. Once you entered the heart of the hotel, the real revelry began. This was the place where the likes of Errol Flynn partied. Excessive drinking was practically a Garden of Allah ritual. The bartender, a maestro of mixology, concocted cocktails that could make Hemingway blush. As the night aged, so did inhibitions. The stars, whether Fitzgerald with his novels or Flynn with his swashbuckling charm, were no strangers to the allure of a well-filled glass. But it wasn't just the booze that flowed there, it was secrets and scandals too. You'd find affairs blooming amidst the potted palms, trysts concealed behind heavy velvet curtains, stars whispered sweet promises under dim chandeliers, knowing full well that the dawn would uncover their transgressions. Gossip flowed through the garden like the wine in their glasses. In 1930, a notorious party at the garden had F. Scott Fitzgerald at the center of a fiery altercation. He reportedly threw a champagne glass at his wife Zelda during a heated argument. The party didn't just end in a whisper, it made headlines across the nation. These parties were wild. The Garden of Allah was a melting pot of vice and virtue, an incubator for scandal and salacious stories. Imagine, in the 1920s and 30s, the world was emerging from the constraints of prohibition, and Hollywood had a thirst to quench. If you'd attended, you'd be swept into a tempest of cocktails and carousing, where the laughter was raucous, the music was intoxicating, and the shadows concealed more than you could imagine. It was a place where stars shone brightest and fell hardest, where Hollywood's secrets and sins were laid bare under the California stars. These parties were a whirlwind of decadence and debauchery, where the only rule was to indulge in every whim. The excesses of the Marion Davies Beach House On the sun-kissed shores of Santa Monica in the 1920s, that's where you'd find the exclusive world of Marion Davies Beach House bashes, where the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst and his mesmerizing mistress Marion Davies played host to extravagant gatherings that redefined the very essence of opulence. It was in this very house that a Hollywood star almost got shot. The scene was set against the backdrop of the Pacific Ocean, where golden sands met the blue horizon. The likes of Charlie Chaplin, the silent film maestro, and Greta Garbo, the enigmatic siren, were said to have partied there. However, chaos wasn't just a stranger, it was an unwelcome guest at these parties. 
The very extravagance that made these parties legendary also made them vulnerable to spiraling into mayhem. It wasn't unusual for the evening to end in a storm of shouting, shoving, and sometimes even broken glasses. For example, a notorious incident took place in 1924 when Hearst, known for his temper, allegedly pulled a gun on fellow guest Charlie Chaplin during an argument. It was the sort of drama that would give tabloids enough material to fuel their presses for weeks. If you were to attend such parties, you'd be a witness to history, a participant in the surreal world where excess was an art form. You'd see stars of the silver screen at the pinnacle of their fame, dressed in their finest, yet sometimes descending into the depths of chaos. You'd see the allure of Hollywood, but also the dark side of indulgence. These beach house bashes weren't just parties, they were a representation of the things that happened when Hollywood stars came together and decided to indulge in whatever they wanted to do. When the cameras were not present, these beach house bashes were a source of escape from the pressures of fame. These parties, as crazy as they seemed, were like a scene from Judy Garland's life. As successful as she seemed on the outside, Judy's personal life was as scandalous and as chaotic as some of these parties. When Virginia Hill, the glamorous socialite and rumored mob courier, was found dead in her Austrian home, Hollywood was abuzz with whispers. Hill, who had been romantically linked to stars like Errol Flynn and Joe Adonis, was more than just a pretty face. She was a woman who knew too much. A woman who had navigated the dangerous waters between Hollywood fame and organized crime. Was her death a suicide, as officially reported? Or was it something far more sinister? Virginia Hill is just one example of the complex web of connections between Hollywood and the mob, a web that we're about to untangle in this video. We'll delve into 10 shocking stories that reveal the hidden alliances, secret deals, and unspeakable acts that have colored the history of the entertainment industry. From the Rat Pack's mob ties to the mysterious circumstances surrounding Marilyn Monroe's death, we're lifting the curtain on Hollywood's darkest secrets. Some of these tales will leave you speechless, others will make you question the very foundation of Hollywood's glittering facade. Get ready for a roller coaster of revelations. In the early 20th century, Hollywood was a land of dreams and opportunities, a place where anyone with talent and ambition could make it big. But behind the glitz and glamour lay a darker world, one that was intricately tied to the rise of organized crime in America. As Hollywood began to flourish, so did the mob, finding in this burgeoning industry a golden opportunity for profit and influence. The mob's involvement in Hollywood can be traced back to the Prohibition era, a time when alcohol was illegal but demand was high. Speakeasies became the social hubs of the era, and who better to run these establishments than organized crime figures? It wasn't long before Hollywood stars, producers, and directors became regular patrons, rubbing shoulders with gangsters and underworld figures. This was the beginning of a symbiotic relationship that would shape Hollywood for decades to come. But the mob's influence wasn't limited to speakeasies. They saw the potential in the film industry itself. Theaters were a lucrative business, and the mob wanted in. They began by gaining control over labor unions, specifically those associated with the projectionists. By controlling the unions, they could control the theaters, and by extension, the films that got shown. This gave them unprecedented influence over Hollywood, allowing them to dictate terms and even influence the content of films. One of the most notorious figures of this era was Willie Beoff, a mobster with close ties to the Chicago outfit. Beoff had his hands in various Hollywood unions and was instrumental in extorting money from the studios. The studios had little choice but to comply and thus a pattern was established. Hollywood would produce the films and the mob would ensure they got the audience they desired for a price. This was the hidden machinery that powered Hollywood's golden age, a machinery lubricated by corruption, extortion, and organized crime. While the stars smiled for the cameras and the audiences reveled in the magic of cinema, 
Few were aware of the shadowy figures pulling the strings behind the scenes. And so the stage was set for a complex and often dangerous relationship between Hollywood and the mob, a relationship that would lead to shocking alliances, betrayals, and a web of connections so intricate that it would boggle the mind. But this is just the beginning. Prepare yourself for what comes next will reveal the first of many shocking connections that bind the world of entertainment to the underworld. Frank Sinatra, the iconic crooner known for his velvety voice and timeless hits, was the epitome of Hollywood glamour. But behind the smooth persona lay a man entangled in a web of controversy, a man whose life was as complex as the songs he sang. Sinatra's alleged ties to the mob have been the subject of speculation for decades, and while the full truth may never be known, there's enough evidence to paint a compelling picture. Sinatra's connection to the mob reportedly began in the early stages of his career, a time when he was struggling to make a name for himself. It was the 1940s, and Sinatra was desperate for a break. Enter Skinny D'Amato, a nightclub owner with known ties to the mob. D'Amato took a liking to Sinatra and offered him regular gigs at his club, the 500 Club, in Atlantic City. This was Sinatra's first brush with the underworld, and it would set the stage for a lifetime of murky associations. But it wasn't just about gigs and nightclubs. Sinatra's mob connections allegedly extended to his personal life as well. Rumors swirled about his friendship with Sam Giancana, a notorious Chicago mobster. The two were often seen together, and Sinatra even went as far as to introduce Giancana to John F. Kennedy during the 1960 presidential campaign. This raised eyebrows, to say the least, and led many to question the extent of Sinatra's involvement with organized crime. Then there was the Cal Neva Lodge, a casino resort straddling the border between California and Nevada. Sinatra became a part owner of the establishment in 1960, and it wasn't long before it became a hot spot for celebrities and gangsters alike. The Rat Pack performed there, and high-profile guests included the likes of Marilyn Monroe and Dean Martin, but the resort was also frequented by mob figures, and it was rumored that illegal activities, including gambling and money laundering, were taking place behind closed doors. Sinatra's gaming license was eventually revoked, casting a dark shadow over his reputation. Despite the controversies, Sinatra's career continued to soar. He won awards, sold millions of records, and became a Hollywood legend, but the questions remained casting a long shadow that would follow him to his grave. Was Sinatra merely a pawn in the mob's grander schemes, or was he an active participant in their illicit activities? The lines were blurred, and the truth, it seemed, was as elusive as the man himself. As we peel back the layers of Sinatra's complex life, we're left to ponder the ethical dilemmas that come with such associations. Can talent and charisma ever fully eclipse a life lived on the edge of morality? Hold on tight, because as shocking as Sinatra's story may be, it's just one piece of a much larger puzzle. Up next, we delve into the Rat Pack's own connections to the mob, and trust us, you won't want to miss it. In the glitzy world of Hollywood, where stars are born and legends are made, not everyone gets a happy ending. Such was the case for Johnny Stompanato, a handsome but ill-fated figure whose life was cut short under mysterious circumstances. Stompanato, a bodyguard and enforcer for the infamous gangster Mickey Cohen, was also known for his tumultuous relationship with actress Lana Turner. Their love affair was the talk of the town, but it would ultimately lead to a tragic and shocking conclusion. On the night of April 4, 1958, Stompanato was found dead in Lana Turner's Beverly Hills home, stabbed in the abdomen. The official story was that he had been killed by Turner's 14-year-old daughter, Cheryl Crane, in an attempt to protect her mother from Stompanato's violent outbursts. The case was quickly closed, ruled as justifiable homicide, but questions lingered. Was it really a simple case of self-defense, or was there more to the story? Stompanato was no stranger to the darker aspects of life. His association with Mickey Cohen gave him access to the seedy underbelly of Hollywood, a world where crime and glamour often went hand in hand. He was known to be possessive and volatile, traits that made his relationship with Lana Turner a ticking time bomb. 
But could a man with such dangerous connections really be taken down by a teenager? As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered a web of intrigue that extended far beyond a troubled love affair. Stompanato had made enemies, both in the criminal world and in Hollywood. His death could have been the result of a mob hit, a jealous lover, or even a cover-up orchestrated by the studios to protect Lana Turner's reputation. Each theory had its merits, but none could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The mystery of Johnny Stompanato's death remains unsolved to this day, a haunting reminder of the blurred lines between fame and infamy, love and obsession, truth and deception. It's a story that encapsulates the complex relationship between Hollywood and the mob, a relationship built on secrets, lies, and the ever-present allure of the spotlight. But as we delve into this tale of love gone wrong and lives cut short, we must also introduce another key player in Hollywood's hidden history, the Fixers. These are the men and women tasked with cleaning up the industry's messes, and their role is as crucial as it is controversial. In a world where image is everything, Hollywood has always had its fair share of scandals. From affairs and addictions to criminal activities, the lives of celebrities are often as dramatic off-screen as they are on-screen. But have you ever wondered how some of these scandals seem to vanish into thin air, leaving no trace behind? The answer lies in the shadowy figures known as Hollywood fixers. These fixers are the unsung heroes, or perhaps more fittingly, the unseen puppet masters of the entertainment industry. They are the crisis managers, the spin doctors, the ones who make problems go away, often before the public even catches a whiff of them. And more often than not, these fixers have connections to organized crime, making them the crucial link between the mob and Hollywood. One of the most famous fixers was Eddie Mannix, a man whose name is synonymous with the golden age of Hollywood. Mannix was a studio executive at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, but his real job was much more clandestine. He was the go-to guy for handling the studio's dirty laundry, from hushing up affairs and abortions to dealing with drunk driving incidents and drug addictions. Mannix was so effective at his job that he earned the nickname The Fixer, and his methods were anything but orthodox. He had contacts within the police force, the media, and yes, the mob making him a formidable force in the Hollywood landscape. But Mannix wasn't the only one. There were others like him, each serving different studios and celebrities, each with their own set of skills and contacts. These fixers operated in the background, invisible yet omnipresent, ensuring that the show could go on no matter what. However, the role of a fixer wasn't just about damage control. It was also about control, period. By handling the personal crises of stars and studio executives, fixers gained immense power and influence, often wielding it to further their own interests or those of their mob associates. It was a symbiotic relationship, one that allowed both parties to thrive in a system built on secrets and lies. As we peel back the layers of Hollywood's glamorous facade, we're confronted with a sobering reality. The industry we adore is far from perfect, and the people who keep it running are not always the heroes we imagine them to be. Next, we have a shocking revelation about a beloved actress that will make you question everything you thought you knew about Hollywood's golden era. Trust us, you won't want to miss this. Marilyn Monroe, the epitome of Hollywood glamour, remains an enigmatic figure even decades after her untimely death. Known for her beauty and vulnerability, Monroe captivated audiences worldwide. But behind the blonde bombshell persona was a woman entangled in a web of complexities, including alleged ties to organized crime. Monroe's connections to the mob have been a subject of speculation for years, fueled by her relationships with some of the most powerful men of her time. One such relationship was with Frank Sinatra, a man whose own mob ties we've already explored. Sinatra introduced Monroe to Sam Giancana, the notorious Chicago mobster. This wasn't a casual introduction. Monroe and Giancana were seen together on multiple occasions, leading many to wonder about the nature of their relationship. But it wasn't just Sinatra and Giancana. Monroe was also linked to the Rat Pack, a group known for their mob connections. She was a frequent guest at their Las Vegas performances and private parties, further intertwining her life with figures from the criminal underworld. 
Then there's the mystery surrounding her death. Officially ruled as a suicide, Monroe's passing has been shrouded in conspiracy theories, many of which involve the mob. Some believe that she was silenced to prevent her from revealing sensitive information about her high-profile relationships, including her alleged affairs with John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy. Given that both the Kennedys and the mob were fighting for control over various aspects of American society, Monroe could have been caught in a dangerous crossfire. As we delve deeper into Monroe's life, we're left with more questions than answers. Was she merely a pawn in a larger game of power and control? Or did she willingly engage with figures from the mob, fully aware of the risks involved? The answers are elusive, adding another layer of mystery to an already enigmatic life. As we ponder these questions, it's crucial to consider the broader context. Monroe was not an isolated case. She was part of a larger system that allowed, and perhaps even encouraged, such connections to flourish. Up next, we'll explore how the mob infiltrated one of the most powerful institutions in Hollywood, labor unions. And trust us, this is a chapter you won't want to skip. The glitz and glamour of Hollywood often overshadow the gritty realities that power the industry. One such reality is the influence of organized crime on Hollywood labor unions. These unions, responsible for representing the interests of writers, actors, and crew members, are a cornerstone of the entertainment world. However, their history is marred by corruption and mob influence, casting a shadow over the industry they serve. In the mid-20th century, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, one of Hollywood's most powerful unions, came under scrutiny for its alleged ties to organized crime. Willie Byoff, an influential figure within the IATSE, was exposed as a mob associate, leading to a scandal that rocked Hollywood to its core. Byoff was eventually convicted of extortion, but the damage was done. The revelation exposed the extent to which the mob had infiltrated Hollywood, raising questions about the integrity of the entire industry. But the IATSE wasn't the only union under the mob's influence. The Teamsters, another powerful union representing truck drivers and other logistical workers in Hollywood, also had its share of controversies. Led by Jimmy Hoffa, a man with well-known connections to organized crime, the Teamsters were implicated in various illegal activities, from money laundering to racketeering. Hoffa's mysterious disappearance in 1975 only added fuel to the fire, leaving many to speculate about the mob's role in his fate. So why did the mob target Hollywood unions? The answer is simple, control. By infiltrating these organizations, organized crime syndicates gained access to a massive workforce and, by extension, the entire Hollywood production process. This influence allowed them to manipulate labor disputes, secure favorable contracts, and even dictate the success or failure of certain films. It was a level of power that went far beyond mere financial gain, affecting the very fabric of American culture. Stay tuned, because up next, we're diving into the making of The Godfather, a film that not only portrayed the mob, but was also influenced by it. You won't believe how deep these connections go. When it comes to cinematic portrayals of the mob, few films hold a candle to The Godfather. Directed by Francis Ford Coppola and based on the novel by Mario Puzo, this epic saga delves into the lives of the Corleone family, offering a nuanced portrayal of organized crime. But what many may not know is that the making of The Godfather was as fraught with drama as the story it told. And yes, the mob was involved. From the outset, the Godfather faced numerous challenges, not least of which was the mob's initial opposition to the film. Concerned that the movie would portray them in a negative light, organized crime figures made their displeasure known, going so far as to threaten the production team and sabotage the film's sets. However, after a series of negotiations, some of which involved key mob figures, the opposition was quelled, and the film received the blessing it needed to proceed. But the mob's involvement didn't end there. Throughout the production, the filmmakers had to navigate a minefield of sensitivities and demands. For instance, it's been reported that real-life mobsters were consulted to ensure the film's authenticity, from the accuracy of the dialogue to the depiction of mob rituals and customs. 
Some even claim that members of organized crime were present on set, overseeing the production to ensure it met their standards. The result was a film that not only captivated audiences, but also received the mob's stamp of approval. The Godfather went on to become one of the most successful films of all time, winning numerous awards and solidifying its place in cinematic history. But its success also raises ethical questions. At what cost did this masterpiece come to be? And how does the mob's involvement affect our perception of the film and, by extension, organized crime itself? As we reflect on the making of The Godfather, we're reminded once again of the complex relationship between Hollywood and the mob, a relationship that extends even to our most cherished cultural products. And as we prepare to delve into our next chapter, we'll explore another facet of this relationship that is often overlooked but equally important, the alleged laundering of mob money through Hollywood films. Up next, we'll look at cases where the mob's financial influence reached into the very heart of Hollywood, affecting not just the stories we see on screen, but also the economics of the industry itself. Trust us, this is a chapter you won't want to miss. The allure of Hollywood isn't just its storytelling magic, it's also a multi-billion dollar industry that churns out profits year after year. But where there's money, there's often a darker side, and in Hollywood's case, that includes allegations of money laundering through film productions. Yes, you heard that right. Some of the movies we know and love may have been financed, at least in part, by organized crime. Money laundering in Hollywood is not a new phenomenon. As far back as the golden age of cinema, there have been whispers about mob money being funneled into film productions. The process is relatively straightforward. Organized crime syndicates invest in a movie, either directly or through shell companies, effectively cleaning their ill-gotten gains by funneling them through a legitimate business. One of the most infamous examples is the 1980 film Heaven's Gate, a notorious box office flop that went massively over budget. While the film's financial failure is well documented, what's less known is the speculation about where some of that money came from. Rumors have swirled for years that Heaven's Gate was partially financed by mob money, although concrete evidence remains elusive. But it's not just historical examples. Allegations persist to this day. Independent films, with their lower budgets and less oversight, are particularly vulnerable. These smaller productions can serve as perfect vehicles for money laundering, allowing organized crime to invest in a film with little scrutiny, all while reaping the benefits if it turns out to be a hit. As we delve into this murky world, we're forced to confront uncomfortable questions about the ethics of entertainment. Can we truly enjoy a film knowing that its existence may be funded by criminal activity? Glamour, fame, and addiction. Hollywood has seen it all. Behind the glitz and the red carpet smiles lies a tale of vice that has gripped some of the industry's biggest names. From legends of the silver screen to modern-day icons, the lure of smoking has ensnared stars in a toxic embrace. Some fought it, others embraced it. But who are the 10 worst smokers in Hollywood history? Hated by some, ignored by others, their stories reveal a side of fame rarely seen. This is the countdown you never knew you needed, but won't want to miss. Join us as we uncover the hidden history of Hollywood's love affair with smoking. John Wayne what started as a little indulgence morphed into a full-blown addiction, and before he knew it, he was smoking over three to six packs of cigarettes per day. Little did he know that this habit would lead to him being diagnosed with a deadly disease in his 50s. John Wayne was in his early 20s when he stepped into Hollywood. He was young and ready to make a name for himself. Just like several Hollywood stars, his career didn't begin with a major role. For the most part of the 1930s, he was starring in a series of low-budget films and trying to put himself out there. Thankfully, his efforts to climb the ladder of success paid off in 1939 when he got the opportunity to star in the film Stagecoach, which turned out to be his breakthrough role. Finally, he had the fame and the success he wanted. It seemed like all was going well, but soon enough, he would find himself buried deep in an addiction that would threaten the life he worked so hard to build. The Duke, as his fans called him, became the undisputed king of westerns. He effortlessly portrayed rugged, no-nonsense cowboys, exuding a charisma that made him stand out. 
There was just something unique about him, some would say he was an epitome of the American hero. His roles in films, The Sands of Iwo Jima, The Longest Day, and True Gift made his viewers love him even more. It was clear that this talented actor had won the hearts of thousands of people. All the awards and accolades were not enough to appreciate his immense talent. But unfortunately, addiction crept in and began to affect his life slowly. It was obvious to the public that this actor was battling with a personal demon, smoking. He was often photographed with a cigarette in his hand, and soon enough, the media was filled with these pictures. While smoking was not uncommon in the 1940s and 50s, it would take a toll on his health in the years to come. The very habit that was once considered cool and sophisticated became the source of his downfall. His health eventually began to decline, and despite the warnings from doctors, John Wayne found it challenging to kick the habit. He could see his life slipping away, but his urge to keep smoking was stronger than his will to stop. It was a dilemma that affected every single area of his life. From career challenges to weight fluctuations, John Wayne became a shadow of himself. Unfortunately, he could not escape the repercussions of his actions. In the mid-60s, he was diagnosed with lung cancer, and that was the beginning of the end for the actor. Hoping that medical intervention would save his life, John Wayne underwent surgery to remove his cancerous lung. But sadly, the disease continued to spread. For the next few years, he fought for his life with everything he had, but unfortunately, death came knocking in the year 1979. The icon passed away on the 11th of June 1979, leaving a void that can never be filled. Clark Gable he was the highest paid actor in his time, Hollywood's Mr. Perfect. But behind closed doors, Clark Gable was struggling with something dark and deadly. Not many people know this, but losing his mother at 10 months and enduring a tumultuous childhood affected Clark Gable in ways that he could not explain. These struggles reportedly drove him to addictions at an early age, and before he realized it, he was in too deep. To the rest of the world, Clark Gable was a dashing actor who could do no wrong. His looks and charisma seemed like the perfect recipe for success in the industry at the time, and his acting skills made him even more desirable in the industry. From the minute he stepped into Hollywood, it was clear that there was something unique about him. His career progressed fast, and his breakout role came in 1931 when he starred in The Painted Desert and Dance Fool's Dance. But it was his portrayal of the charming rogue, Rhett Butler, in the epic film Gone with the Wind that truly solidified his place as one of the greatest actors of his time. From then on, there was no stopping him. One would have thought he would only get roles in romantic films, but Gable was too versatile to be confined to a single genre. From swashbuckling adventures to gritty war films, he proved time and again that he could tackle any role with finesse. Sure, he was making waves in his career, but there was a part of his life that wasn't exactly healthy. Like many of his colleagues, Gable made smoking look like a cool aesthetic. He often had a cigarette in his hand and reportedly smoked at least five packs per day. However, there was nothing cool about this habit and the actor would later face the brunt of his actions. This seemingly glamorous habit would prove to be his undoing, and like many in that era, it seemed like Gable wasn't fully aware of what smoking could do to his health. As the years went by, Gable's health began to suffer in a way that could not be hidden from the world. His fans noticed his body changing, and soon enough, he began to develop heart and respiratory problems. Through it all, he kept trying to pursue his career, but his health would soon frustrate his efforts and affect his career. Sadly, it was said that the actor continued to smoke despite his health condition. His lungs were reportedly damaged to a point where he would rattle when he spoke. It was clear that death was not far away from this actor. He then suffered several heart attacks, all of which led to his eventual death on the 16th of November, 1960. Bette Davis She was popular in her time for many reasons. One of those reasons was her excessive smoking. Unfortunately, quitting was an option she wasn't willing to take. She was a Hollywood icon with a fire in her heart and a cigarette in her hand. You see, cigarettes were practically like an extension of Bette Davis's persona. In a time when smoking was practically a fashion statement, she often held a cigarette between her fingers with the kind of elegance only she could pull off. 
One thing that was true about the actress was the fact that she didn't pretend or conceal any aspect of her life for the sake of her image. She believed in being authentic, and even when she portrayed characters that smoked, she insisted on bringing these roles to life by smoking on set. It got to a point when it seemed like cigarettes became part of her on-screen persona. Her co-star Henry Fonda once jokingly spoke about her smoking habit. He said, I've been close to Bette Davis for 38 years and I have the cigarette burns to prove it. However, this seemingly harmless habit that she embodied unapologetically affected her health deeply. As the years went by, smoking began to affect her health, and she faced numerous health issues related to the habit. Despite the potential risks, Davis found it hard to let go of this comforting crutch, and quitting smoking proved to be a challenge. Smoking became a constant companion throughout her life, from the highs of her illustrious career to the lows of personal struggles and health battles. Bette Davis's passion for acting and her love for cigarettes seemed intertwined, and the habit followed her like a shadow even in the most stressful and trying times. While she continued to shine on the big screen, smoking was slowly but surely chipping away at her health. Sadly, on October 6, 1989, the famous actress took her final breath. She was 81 years old at the time and died as a result of complications related to breast cancer. It's no secret that her long-standing smoking habit played a part in her health issues. John Cazale John's life was such a mystery. He liked to drink, he liked to smoke, he liked beautiful women, and he liked to act. This was how the filmmaker, Richard Shepard, described John Cazale. The actor was known to be a focused and talented man who lived life with intensity. He wasn't as famous as a lot of other actors, but whenever he was given a role, he embodied it excellently. Cazale's big break in the film industry came when a keen-eyed producer named Fred Roos caught him in action during the 1971 revival of Line, where he starred alongside Richard Dreyfuss. It was the start of something truly remarkable. He later won hearts of viewers when he portrayed the role as Fredo Corleone in The Godfather and for several other roles as well. Not only was he a phenomenal actor, he also taught and inspired several other actors like Pacino. In an interview with New York Times, Al Pacino spoke about the actor saying, I learned so much from him. I had done a lot of theater and three films with him. He was inspiring, he just was, and he didn't get credit for any of it. Not many people know this aspect of the actor's love life, but the stunning Meryl Streep, yes, that Meryl Streep, was head over heels for Cazale. Their love story bloomed, and they dated until his unfortunate demise. It's been years since he passed, but one thing is for sure, she still cherishes him and appreciates his impact on her life. Unfortunately, this talented actor also had his vices, lethal ones at that. John Cazale was a heavy smoker for several years. It got so bad that his health began to decline. Unfortunately, he was diagnosed with lung cancer in his early 40s and began battling for his life. Still highly optimistic about his work, the actor continued acting wholeheartedly. While he was working on his final project, The Deer Hunter, he was battling cancer, but he still wanted to bring his character to life. When Cazale's illness left him uninsurable for the movie, Robert De Niro himself stepped in and paid for his friend's expenses. Sadly, the disease spread to his bones rapidly, and he couldn't live to see the finished product of the movie he filmed. The actor passed away on the 13th of March, 1978, leaving his fans and well-wishers heartbroken. Errol Flynn He wanted to live an adventurous life. He had already set his plan in motion, but fate had other plans. From the moment he graced the silver screen, Errol Flynn stole hearts and left audiences swooning with his devil-may-care charm. With his unique talent and undeniable charisma, he became the ultimate Hollywood heartthrob of his time. Truth be told, Flynn's career was a whirlwind of successes, starting with his breakout role in Captain Blood, where he played the dashing pirate, Captain Peter Blood. He didn't struggle to get roles as he was one of the most sought-after actors in his time, but while he was conquering the silver screen, there was one habit that snuck into his life and threatened his health. Oh, that signature smirk of Flynn's was often accompanied by a cigarette, creating an image of the suave and rugged leading man. Flynn's smoking habit didn't just stay on set, it followed him into every aspect of his life, from glamorous Hollywood parties to his private moments of contemplation. As the years went by, Flynn's health began to suffer, and the consequences of his smoking habit became evidence. 
His once vibrant and energetic persona was starting to show signs of wear and tear, like a ship battered by relentless storms. But even as smoking took its toll, Flynn's career accomplishments continued to shine brightly. His performances in films like Dodge City and They Died With Their Boots On further solidified his status as a beloved and accomplished actor. Audiences adored him, not just for his dashing looks and daring roles, but for the genuine talent he brought to the screen. As the tide turned, Flynn faced health challenges that no swashbuckling hero could vanquish. His smoking habit played a part in his declining health, and in 1959, he passed away at the age of 50. The world mourned the loss of a true Hollywood legend, a man whose adventurous spirit and charismatic performances left an indelible mark on the history of cinema. Humphrey Bogart He had it all, the money, the fame, and the women, but even the most captivating people have dark sides. Let's go back to the beginning, shall we? The screen legend was born on December 25, 1899. As soon as he discovered his passion for acting, he started working towards growing his career. Little did he know that something as innocent as a puff of smoke would change his life forever. As Bogart's career began to soar, he found himself cracking cigarettes more and more each passing day. Initially, it looked cool and added to his suave exterior, but as time went by, it began to look like a full-blown addiction. Smoking wasn't just a habit for Bogart. It became woven into the very fabric of his roles. From Rick Blaine in Casablanca to Sam Spade in The Maltese Falcon, the cigarette was his trusty sidekick, adding that extra touch of mystery to his characters. Soon enough, the side effects of this vice began to manifest and found himself struggling to quit this habit that had become a part of him. It became disturbing at a point as friends and family members helplessly watched him drown in this addiction. His health condition got worse in the 1950s. He was diagnosed with cancer and was still struggling. He reportedly coughed a lot and experienced shortness of breath often. It became increasingly difficult for him to eat, walk, and do other basic things. Sadly, he didn't get better. Despite his valiant efforts, it was a battle that Bogart ultimately lost. On January 14, 1957, at the age of 57, the world bid farewell to an icon whose life was both extraordinary and flawed, shaped by the choices he made, including his tumultuous relationship with smoking. Tallulah Bankhead She was famous for notoriety, and she didn't really care what people thought about her. She wanted to live by her own rules, no matter the cost. One thing is true, Tallulah Bankhead was a force to be reckoned with. But all through her career, there was one thing that always seemed to be right there with her, a cigarette. Being born into a family of actors meant that Tallulah Bankhead had the talent running through her veins. Sure, she put in the work and honed her skill, stealing hearts with her sassy southern charm stole hearts wherever she went. When she got famous, things changed a bit. She found herself indulging in several vices, but she didn't care. She showed her love for smoking everywhere, lighting up countless nights of performances and Hollywood soirees. Whether she was delivering a powerful monologue or cracking jokes, you could bet she had a cigarette in hand. Tallulah had a magnetic personality that drew people in like bees to honey. She had a knack for making everyone around her feel special and appreciated. Her wit was razor sharp, and her no-nonsense attitude kept things interesting. People admired her for being unapologetically herself, a true original in a world of conformity. Unfortunately, just like in a classic Hollywood plotline, Smoking's romance with Tallulah had a darker side. As the years passed, her health began to suffer. The cigarettes that once added to her charm were now taking a toll on her well-being. Her smoking led to a series of health issues, including respiratory problems and throat conditions. It was a tough battle for her, as she tried to balance her love for cigarettes with the need to take care of herself. It wasn't an easy road but she faced it with the same tenacity that defined her career. Despite the health struggles, Tallulah continued to dazzle audiences and remained a beloved figure in showbiz. People couldn't help but admire her for her talent, charisma, and the undeniable spark that made her who she was. Sadly, in 1968, at the age of 66, and it was clear that smoking played a part in her ill fate. Rod Serling Three to four packs of cigarettes per day, this was Rod Serling's reality. Was there a reason why this Hollywood genius was drowning himself in vices? Let's find out. 
Some people believe that Rod Serling lived a very unhappy life. Despite the success he experienced in his early years, he struggled to find peace and contentment. As someone who was fascinated by show business at an early age, he was reportedly a self-taught dramatist, and he started selling TV scripts while in college. He spent the most part of his early years in Hollywood trying to create a masterpiece that would grab the attention of people. Thankfully, he hit the jackpot when he created The Twilight Zone. But his joy soon turned into fear and pain. In the following years, the filmmaker drowned in alcohol and cigarettes for several reasons. It was said that his struggles were career-related. Some reports claim that he had personal roles problems as well. Unfortunately, his incessant smoking caught up with him, leading to health complications. He later died at the age of 50 during a heart surgery in 1975. Yule Brynner now that I'm gone, I tell you, don't smoke. Whatever you do, just don't smoke. These were the words that Yul Brynner uttered in an anti-smoking ad he made before he passed away. He knew that he was dying and he desperately wanted the world to know the dangers of smoking. If he could turn back the hands of time, he wouldn't have ever smoked a single cigarette. This man was a true Hollywood icon, with his striking bald head and intense gaze, was a man who commanded the silver screen like no other. But behind that persona, there was a habit that clung to him tighter than his iconic wardrobe. From playing the iconic King Mongkut in The King and I, to his unforgettable role as the enigmatic gunslinger in Westworld, Yule's performances left audiences spellbound. People loved Yule Brynner not just for his talent, but also for his authenticity. He was never one to pretend to be something he wasn't, Yule embraced his baldness and even used it as a signature feature, along with his beloved smoking habit. Unfortunately, smoking's impact on Yule's health was something he couldn't ignore forever. As the years passed, the toll of smoking caught up with him. He battled against lung cancer, a consequence of his longtime affair with cigarettes. In his later years, Yule used his fame to advocate against smoking. He appeared in powerful public service announcements, urging others to break free from the grip of tobacco. It was a bittersweet irony that a habit he struggled to quit became a catalyst for positive change. In 1985, Yul Brynner passed away, leaving behind a legacy that remains etched in Hollywood history. Irene Ryan She was just looking for something to comfort her and ease her stress when she started smoking initially, but with time, her health started deteriorating. Before she became famous, Irene Ryan was a simple, innocent-looking girl. She was born in 1902 in Texas, and most people who came in contact with her could tell that she had an undeniable passion for the arts from a young age. As soon as she launched her career, it was only a matter of time before her star began to rise. It was in the early 1930s that Irene's became the talk of Hollywood. Despite her seemingly calm aura, she portrayed her characters with fierceness and boldness. Shortly after, her talents caught the attention of Hollywood producers, and she started getting major roles. One thing that was true about the actress was her versatility. She could do it all, from heartwarming dramas to laugh-out-loud comedies. But with fame came a desire to indulge in vices that would affect her in ways she never imagined. But before she started seeing the effects of her actions, she continued doing what she loved doing the most. It was on the small screen that Irene truly found her calling. In the 1960s, she landed the role that would etch her name in television history, Granny Clampett, in the wildly popular sitcom The Beverly Hillbillies. She became the lovable, feisty Granny Stolharts left and right, earning Irene three Emmy nominations during the show's run. Off the camera, she was a total gem. Always hardworking, Irene had a magnetic personality that drew people. You couldn't help but feel at ease around her. However, there was the not-so-glamorous side of her life. Irene Ryan was a heavy smoker, and it affected her. Like some of her colleagues, she was often spotted with a cigarette between her fingers during interviews and breaks on set. As the years rolled by, Irene's health began to take a hit. Those darn cigarettes took their toll, and she faced respiratory issues and became prone to frequent illnesses. It's heartbreaking to think that the thing that gave her comfort and ease would end up causing so much harm. But hey, Irene was no quitter. Despite her health struggles, she soldiered on, continuing to entertain and bring joy to her audiences until she passed on in 1973. She died as a result of a heart disease.
It's sad that these talented stars lost their lives to an addiction. They will surely forever be missed. As painful as some of these deaths were, there are some Hollywood stars who passed away as a result of weird occurrences that no one saw coming. Click on this video to see some famous Hollywood stars who passed away mysteriously.